Nigel, I was wondering, um, I expect you've noticed the, the BBC have just um, produced a new adaptation of The Pursuit of Love. Yes. Have you seen it? Uh, I tried to watch it, yes. <laughs> but I, I found I couldn't suffer it for long because I didn't think they were quite doing it in the right... Um, they didn't have Nancy Mitford's um, panache. No. Aristocratic draw and all that. Uh, so I thought it was rather lacking in the necessary aristocratic qualities that would make it really comic. Right. Uh, I watched it. I quite, kind of, quite liked it. I thought it was vivid. At any rate, if, yes. if perhaps uh, a little, uh, little overdone. Yes, um, very heavy-handed. A lot of it. But of course, and they always and they every shot of the, of the place they lived in will be some huge mansion of a duke or something. And I mean, the joke with them is that they're impoverished aristocrats. Yes. So I, I just thought it was a bit, yes, bit brain dead. Uh, You've read the book, I, I dare say. Oh, yes, fortunately. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. One, one wonders, really, in retrospect, whether uh, that particular book or Love in a Cold Climate were quite as iconic as was felt at the time. Um, I mean, uh, I suppose the... the, the the beautiful young things and that kind of sense of social revolution um, was graphically portrayed. Uh, did you? I mean, how do you feel that, that the book signifies in in terms of social history and so forth? Yes, I, mean, I think that was it. She captured that um, generation who. Um, continued to be kind of running things after the war as well as before the war when she was writing and I think she captured it very well and in a sufficiently light-hearted manner uh, and I think she's better than Evelyn War, who is sort of attempting to do the same thing but he, he's um, I think he's a, a bit heavy-handed compared with her she's always more fun well, I, mean, I, I found this, I was reading her, and then I thought, well, oh, I'll just read a bit of Put Out More Flags, which I happen to have a copy of, and I thought, oh, it's a bit leaden compared with her. Well, interestingly, um, she attributes much of her success to Evelyn Moore. Yes. Because she was essentially um, self-educated. Yes. And uh, Moore took her under his wing. Yeah. And encourage her, her writing. Yes, yeah. Um, and of course, satirise the beautiful young things in his in his own books. Yes, he did. You see, but with his satire, it's it's a bit grotesque and sort of harsh, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas with her, it's always light-hearted, even though pretty awful things can be happening. Um, like the war. Now, you see, I watch that, and they start off with the great bomb descending on London and then a big pregnant Lily James sitting there in a fur coat waiting for someone to rescue her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, fair enough. You know. <laughs> I sometimes think that um, your generation, you know, the post-Second World War generation and, and the the sort of so, the social revolution of the 60s um, has a degree of comparability. I mean, a lot of your contemporaries, um, rather as with Frederick Raphael's glittering prizes, yes. um, went on to achieve notable reputations. Yes, yes, they did. Um, and one of them, of course, was was uh, Sheridan Morley. I, I think yes. you knew the Mor you know the Morleys very well. Yes, yeah. Oh, Sherry was a great mate, a great mate. Uh, we'd had, uh, I think, we had a joint twenty first birthday party at my dad's place in Chilton, and uh, 
and we um, kept friends thereafter. And his father Robert was a his, great fan of yours. His, fa well, his father Robert <laughs> tolerated me. Um, I was just because I knew you were going to ask me about these sort of things. I was just reading it up a bit, and uh, apparently Robert uh, uh, Sherry's two friends, Chris Matthew and uh, Nigel Frith, according to the biography, um, R Robert um, uh, took joy in their company or something like that. So. Yes, yes. But um, uh, but I mean, he 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 liked me, I think, sometimes because he could make fun of me. Uh, and um, one great occasion was when we were all in Paris, and little Nigel was at that point was a, was a wine buff, you see. I knew everything about wine, and we went out to some restaurant or other, and I think it was just a kind of wine drinking place. And I, and I insisted on having the catalogue and looked through it all, and I said, Robert, we've got to have this. This is Chateau Margaux, and it's only 11 francs which was quite a lot, but not a heck of a lot, you know. Oh, no, Nigel, oh, no, no, we don't. Yeah, no, look, really, honestly, you won't get another chance like this. Oh, all right, then, go on. And so the sommelier went off and um, I brought it back, and then um, he showed it to me and poured it out for me to taste, and I went, but it's white. <laughs> and everybody fell about, OK? Ah! I'd been looking in the white section of the... Um, and the, apparently there is yes. a white Chateau Margaux instead of the famous claret, which I thought it was. So, um, yes, well, I remember that um, when he came down to see the dress rehearsal of your show, Commedia, yes. yeah. um, to offer advice, you know, of a great theatrical legend, yes. give, give you the benefit of his advice. He kept on saying, oh, he says, you're clever, Nigel, you're <laughs> clever, Nigel, and uh, you're making me think that this was perhaps ironic. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yes. Um, yeah, we, but, all, we all went to see Robert. He was um, filming Hotel Paradiso in Paris, and um, he said to Abby, his daughter, Annabelle, uh, who was a great pal of mine too, um, I'm so bored, you can come over and see me, darling, and um, I'll take you out for lunch and things like that. And, and she said, could she bring some friends? And so I think about five of us eventually piled over there, and um, it was wonderful. Robert said, oh, they're giving me, I mean, this was 66 or so, something like that. They're giving me 250 pounds a day in expenses I can't spend at all, so we'll go out for lunch on it. And he took us out for lunch every day. It was, it was um, wonderful. And at one point, we, we, um, it, was a, it was a terrible old Morris Minor, Ian McCulloch's Morris Minor that we went in. And what, the, uh, the famous actor? That we, yes, yes, he yes, was. Yes, he, he, he yeah. was. I mean, and at the time, he was in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, he, he played the lead in Cymbali and opposite Vanessa Redgrave as a young girl. Yeah. Um, but um, yes, but he, but, uh, he it didn't mean he had any money, and this Morris Minor was a terrible thing, but it was coupe. And um, when we were in Paris, it was a lovely sunny day, so we put the coupe down, and Robert said, Oh, come along, let's go in the car, you see. And there were already too many of us to get in, so we put him in the middle, and uh, Graham and I sat on the roof, you see, at the back, because it was coupe, and we were driving down the Champs Elysees, and, they go, and this gendarme comes up. <laughs> But was this the, sorry, sorry yeah. Rob, was was this the occasion when uh, well you actually met? Uh, yes, I mean Na Rob, Nancy met. Yes, one of one of um, Robert's entertainments he had for us. He says, "Well, um, tomorrow, look, come come to the Ritz at Ritz Bar at six o'clock, and um, we'll meet Nancy Metford because she lived in Paris, and um, yeah. he and Nancy had collaborated on a play which was called." Um, Little Hut, big right. success, big. It was a long-running West End play, and it was French originally. She helped, sort of, she translated it from the French and worked on Robert with it. So, so you you met her? Yes, yes. That's, and uh, that's I got, astonishing. I got I got some brownie points with her because um, it was at six o'clock in the Ritz, you see, and and because uh, he knew all these comedy Francaise people because they'd been over to play in the Old Witch, which was the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. 
uh, and he got to know them, uh, they were out to do something in the afternoon with them. And I said, no, we can't. We've got to be at the Ritz at six o'clock. And they said, oh, we all fit it in. And I thought, you bloody well won't, so I'm not coming. So I didn't come. So I went to the Ritz myself and tried to find the bar. Um, and uh, there were Robert and Nancy, and um, I was the only one who'd, who'd, who'd turned up on time, you see. So brownie points were accrued. And uh, how did you find her? Did she live up to her reputation? Yeah, she was lovely. She was lovely. No, you know, she didn't sort of put on it. Well, she obviously didn't need to put on airs, but she was just sort of very soigné, fashionable, gracious, kind. Yes. And, um, and she, at the end of it all, she said, oh, well, come and have a drink with me tomorrow night, you see. So um, we all went off the next night, six o'clock, to the Rue Monsieur, which is where she had an apartment, and it was, uh, it was lovely. No, that's, that's so wonderful. And they they told her about me and my gaff with the uh, the wine you see and <laughs> she said oh she said oh I've got lots of wine catalogues Nicola catalogues would you like would you like them so I said yes so she went off and got them and I've still got them somewhere and, and she um, she well she wrote it to me well that's a that's a wonderful recollection <laughs> well that probably brings us full circle um, yes you're all knowing Nancy Medford and the BBC attempting to... Um, yes, if only they would ask me, I'd have <laughs> given them some tips. <laughs> yes, well maybe when they attempt a third adaptation, yes. you can act as consultant. Yes. Anyway, very interesting. Brilliant. That was great.